in which we're going to get into today, but also connecting into uh, service-oriented architectures and the such. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk sa about something which is much closer to uh, what we can see in Node, for example, and where middleware can be seen as something like this. Now, if you've never been uh, exposed to middleware, and if this thing doesn't make sense to you at all, that should not be a problem because I really hope that by the end of this morning we'll get a grasp about this and also do some practice uh, so to understand what these whole things mean. So before we start, let me uh, introduce ourselves really quickly. That's Marco, my colleague. Hello. Uh, Marco is uh, kind of an explorer guy. He's the one who introduces uh, new things and technologies in our company. And he's an avid learner. He's keen about functional programming, domain-driven design. He also likes to keep code clean. So uh, yeah, that's Mark. But he also have a, a weak, weak side, a weak spot. He's a chocolate lover. He's really keen about that. And well, you'll guess who made the demo for, for, uh, for today based on this hint. Well, um, I'm not alone, luckily, today. And there's my colleague and friend Steve with me. So he also enjoys very much traveling and why he does that and also why it works. He likes to have a broad overview on things. So why it works is mainly interested in software architecture and user experience. And as you can see, he's also a kind of a lover of Hawaiian t-shirts and he's also really into sports, mainly baseball. So probably in a few years, it's going to end up like this. Uh, OK, but we are both engineers at uh, MV Labs, a company which is based in the northeast of Italy, so not that far away from here. But uh, let's cut the part about yourself. What about you? So just a quick question to uh, get some out of you. So who is accustomed to work with a full fledged framework like Symfony or Zen Framework or KPHP or whatever? MVC based approach, something like that. Okay, so Quite almost everybody. Who's not? So is there somebody? Okay, nobody. Great. And just some other question. Who's uh, accustomed to the concept of dependency injection? Yeah, almost everybody. Value objects? Yeah. Again, let's oh. turn the question the other way. Who's not? Who who does no does no does know nothing about dependency injection? Nobody. Great. Great. Good way to start. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead with something more tricky. PSR seven. Who's a customer with PSR seven? Okay. Good part. And so there there's someone who's never heard about that, or, or never used, never got a. A good grasp of it. Yeah, not problem. I'm not asking if you just killed someone. Just <laughs> <laughs> it, it's good. I mean, not knowing about the details. Yeah, and last step. Well, that's what we're going to talk about it today. So it's just somebody here who can step and come <laughs> to help us because he already knows middleware, sends, and expressive. Yeah, somebody. Okay, so if you want, to go. no, <laughs> all right. We got an extra seat too. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, well, the reason why we made these questions is because we've prepared this. We, we weren't aware of uh, how uh, good the, the preparation of, of you would have been today. So we prepared a series of exercises with increasing grade of difficulty. And we'll see how far we will, we will reach at by the end of the day. If we're not finished here, we can like continue if you'd like. We, you can continue home. There's a whole repository we can use. So. Uh, if you would like to follow along this presentation, there's a link there. Oh, it's quite long. You, you haven't used the URL shortener. No, I just <laughs> thought I could use the URL shortener. OK. I didn't. So that's the shortest thing Marco could come up with. And well, so we, let's wait a we, second. We, yeah. Somebody is yeah. typing that down. There's not going to be too much anyways. Like most of the things hopefully are going to be on code. So do not despair if you don't feel like copying this thing early in the morning sort of. 
So, okay, uh, what are the plans for today? Like my very own plans include a bit of relaxing, chilling out, but before that there's some work to do as always. And the thing is to talk here about middleware, about compliant frameworks. So the frameworks where such approach can be used and how they uh, do work. And also we're going to talk about related aspects. So the idea is to convey a grasp, a good grasp of how uh, the whole middleware thing works. So Zen Expressive is mentioned, but it's actually going to be most of a side effect today. It's something we're going to learn all, almost by chance, by accident. It's not going to be the focus of what we're going to see today. It's something we'll take home with us, but it, this is not about Zen Expressive. It's mostly about middleware. So that's something we can just uh, keep on the side, although it's, I think, quite useful to know it because it, it's very small and it allows to, um, to create component-based applications. It's a sort of a micro-framework compliant with different PSR. So it can turn out quite handy if we need to do something quickly, some APIs, which is the, the, the topic of today's talk. And well, let's go, I would say. So if we have our virtual appliance, first things we uh, want and need to do is to uh, put ourselves in this uh, directory here. So as far as I know, var www.html summer camp is the uh, base directory for all of the workshops today. So it's good to familiarize yourself with that. And we're going to get into PHP middleware, which is our area within that. And the, things, the first thing we do is checking out branch a one expressive skeleton. We've cloned the, uh, actually Ivo did, <laughs> cloned the repository on the virtual machine so we, don't, we won't have to use a network. And so by checking uh, this branch out, we will already have this uh, document. Since there's a few of us here, it will be hard to like, answer all of the questions. We've put together a sort of walkthrough, which everyone can use during this workshop, just to follow along. All right, once you're there, you can go to this URL on the top, http colon slash slash php dot webrc, and we would recommend to do that using Postman. Uh, since it's, it's, yeah, I yeah. Can, yeah. Uh, since it's uh, inside VirtualBox, uh, you should use, uh, there's some problem with the GPU, so you should launch it from the console using the command postman uh, space dash dash disable uh, dash GPU. Just a quick check out. So are we all set with the uh, code base? No? Okay. Just We'll catch up later, okay, but is everyone okay with the branch uh, checking it out within the... Re okay. So the branch is, uh, well, you type zero, 01 and then autocomplete. And it will autocomplete for you. Yeah, if, if, you, if you don't know, um, on the virtual machine, if you uh, push the tab button after just inserting the first number, 01, it will autocomplete the rest of the of the branch name. And as for Postman, Marco was suggesting to use it from the command line. So we open up a terminal in the Ubuntu uh, menu. We open the menu, we type terminal, and we will have a console. And there we can uh, enter the Postman uh, disabled with the G uh, disabled GPU setting, and it should load uh, for us. Are we, good? Are we good with this? Any problems? Everything's smooth so far? Okay. If there are any issues, just raise your hand and we'll come. We're in two, so we'll do our best to you. All yeah. right. And, well, if you do that, you should probably get something like this. This is the welcome page of the skeleton application of Zand Expressive. So if you install Zand Expressive, that's what you get at the beginning if you choose the right options. So everybody is here, arrive at this point. Somebody did not. 
Yeah, no worries. If it doesn't work, just please raise your hand anyways, just to let us know, because we don't want the pace to be too fast or too small. So, or too, uh, too, what? too fast or too slow. Yeah. yeah. I'm still booting up, I think. OK, so uh, from here. This is pretty much the same result which we would have had if we followed the uh, default installation of Zend Expressive, which usually starts through Composer. We have Composer Create Project. And this is a so-called skeleton app, because what we do is to clone this skeleton application locally. And then we start working from there. But the thing is, if we do try this and leave the default settings, or anyways, it's better to say, if you look for Zen Expressive screenshot online, you find something like this, which is a bit different from what we got, which was this. Why so? Well, the thing is that during installation, you get a series of, of questions, and you can sort of configure how you want the framework to behave for you. So the first question is about having um, the, the sort of installation you want. Like the minimal, which is discouraged, installs pretty much nothing. I mean, you, you need to, to add a lot of glue code, boilerplate. It's recommended if you already know the framework, you already know what you want, so you choose the minimal and you build everything by yeah. yourself. Yeah, not, it's not recommended to start. I mean, right, good, good point. Uh, whereas the flat, uh, flat thing is what we're going to use today and doesn't uh, divide the application into modules, which is, I mean, useful as the application complexity grows. The next thing, and here things start to get interesting, we can choose uh, on which um, dependence injection container to use. So we have a choice of Aura, Pimple, or Zen Service Manager. And Zen Service Manager, of course, is the default, but for today's demo, what we did was to use Pimple. So we're, we're going to uh, detach ourselves from the, from the standard. And that's just to see how, what I was mentioning before about how the, the whole thing aims at being sort of um, framework agnostic or Zend agnostic at least. So, we, and then it's time to pick a router. And in this case, again, we're not choosing Zen router, but which is what is the um, sort of default value, fast route, uh, which is chosen, I think, because it has a, ni a nice name. I mean, fast yeah. route, it's going to be fast, right? So. It makes sense. And well, as, as the last questions we have is whether we want to use a templating system. Here again, we can use uh, Zen View, Plates, Twig, or as we're going to do today, and this is why we come up with a different uh, splash page, uh, which is not to use a templating engine. So we'll skip that part and we'll use just play JSON, uh, plain JSON. And at the end, we can choose on uh, which error handler to, to, to pick. And we'll go with whoops. So that means that we'll have uh, so something to catch up our errors for us. We won't have to worry, at least at the beginning, of what well, happens. We'll, we'll have a nice uh, user interface in development mode that will just, just give us a lot of details about the errors <laughs> we will get. Yeah, we, we won't need to, to write a code to do that ourselves. OK. And the nice thing is that once you made these choices, uh, you're not bound to use them forever. Uh, uh, all of these choices are some kind of hidden uh, behind uh, an interface from a framework. So if at uh, a certain point you decide, ah, I choose um, plates for the templating engine, but I would like to use this nice feature that Twig has now, uh, so you can decide to rewrite all your templates and just use uh, Twig instead of Plate. Or you can swap your dependency injection container. And we chose Pimple, but we can choose to use Aura DI or Zen Service Manager if we would like to do that. And uh, from the framework point of view, nothing changes. So that's really nice uh, because we can really uh, choose our components as we see fit. And we would like uh, interoperability to be one of the keywords for today. 
and because it is one of the keywords of Zen Express, so we would like to use components that then we can reuse in some other settings, not just for uh, one project at the time. But uh, how is uh, this framework we're going to use a structure? So at the bottom of it all, uh, we have PSR7 as an abstraction of HTTP messages. So we will go back to get, uh, get back to that later to see it in more details. Then above that, we have a mechanism that is called this middleware dispatcher that is something that just takes an HTTP request and is able to create and return an HTTP response. So it's just handling the HTTP protocol, taking a request and returning a response. And above that, uh, we have usually a general purpose framework or some glue code that just takes in some other components, as we see, for example, a router, dependency injection container, a templating engine, or an error handler, or whatever else you will need uh, in your application, and uh, make these things available uh, to, to the other components. And on top of that, you just build your application, you put your domain, you put your business logic. And this is just uh, a schema, can be quite general. In fact, it's not only Zen Expressive, which is built using this schema. There's, our, there's other frameworks that we will see later. And, but for today, we will have some, uh, some implementation of this concept that will have some names. So we will just like to mention them. So if you find them on your code, you know what they are. So the implementation of PR, PSR7 that we will use is called Diaktoros, that means messenger, because it represents messages. Uh, then above that, we have uh, strategility, uh, that gives an idea of layer, the strategility. On top of that, the framework we will use is, as we said, uh, Zen Expressive, which will compose a router and dependency injection container, and in our case, we will have no templating engine. And on top of that, using everything we had uh, before, we will build our application. So the main idea out of this diagram is that the, the framework, the role of the framework is that of a component glue. We will uh, choose a lot of components. Here and there we want to use fast route, we want to use pimple, uh, we want to use a twig as template the engine, we want to use whoops or a handler uh, or some other components. And the role of the framework is just gluing them together. It will not be a full-fledged framework like Zen Framework or Symfony that we install that and we have everything ready to develop the application. Okay, so it's about time we stop talking and start doing something. Yeah, we have a question. Uh, the, well, I guess uh, every password for the West Ham camp is a web SC. Good point. <laughs> After working for quite a few hours on this, we totally got it for acquainted, so sorry for not sharing that. Uh, anyways, if we go at the location I was mentioning before, this is the layout we get. And this, well, yeah, we, we'll come back later when needed here. The thing is that uh, if we look at the Apache's configuration for, our, for today's uh, uh, example, uh, we will see the document root is pointing to the public directory as it's pretty much usual today. So we start our journey journey to, to see how um, Xander Express, uh, our request on Xander Expressive works, but uh, with the index.php file, which is something like this. What do we have at first? We have the uh, usual composer autoload, autoloading uh, thing. And then what happens really quickly here? First off, we instantiate uh, a container, our dependence injection container. Then we get our uh, expressive application from the container. We do stuff and we run the application. Let's really quickly see what happens in, in here. So where does just, the... So if you have yeah. a question about something, just please ask. Let's be an interactive talk. Yeah. Uh, so where do we get... Because here we're instantiating, I was saying, the uh, dependence injection container, but where does the configuration for it comes from? The thing is that this file is read to get the configuration, so you can check it out on the machine. The thing is that we've got first off, and the order here is important because the parameters are uh, read in this order. 
So the first uh, place where configuration is scattered is the app config provider uh, class, which is something we're going to work with it. Then we have a uh, few locations. So the config autoload directory, all of the files with the global or local, uh, containing the global or local part within them and ending in PHP will be uh, taken into account from the configuration uh, handler. And then we have this file here, which is useful to override the production settings, for instance, if we want to tweak something on our, on our development machine. And at the end, what we get is the merge config, so a uh, whole configuration which will be used uh, within the dependency injection uh, container. Then, uh, there are these two lines I was mentioning. Basically, the first one is puts together a sort of, um, I would say, of stack of things which will happen, among which there's, and these are the importance, the routing middleware and pipe dispatch middleware. Let's forget about the middleware term in here just to see this file is here and takes care of like internals working of the, of the framework. More, um, more interesting, I would say, at, at this point for us is the other file mentioned here, the config routes, which we need to get acquainted with. And this is where we actually declare our routes. So if we want to do something, we, need, we definitely need to put our hand on, hands on there. So, before we have this two, uh, we, we seen we got to a certain point to the slash uh, route. If we get in here, we see we have these two routes. And if we do launch Postman on the on the home uh, route, we see that we get a result. If we uh, enter some route which is not taken into account here, as we see the API ping is nowhere there, we get. Uh, very nice 404 page not found. So we need to declare routes in there in order for them to work. And so if we want to make it work, we need to use the correct URL. And in this case, what happens is that we are reaching this route here. What happens there? The thing is that here we have uh, basically the URL part to be matched, a route name which is useful in, uh, in reverse mode if we want to build the route, but it's not something we're going to see today. Let's just assume that each route has a name. And this is the important part. This is basically telling the framework which uh, code snippet will be targeted upon calling this URL. So if we go to this snippet here, which lies between this uh, source uh, SRC uh, folder app action ping action, we see that it's uh, something like this. And at this point, what we have is basically, uh, we're here, this is the method which is invoked by the framework, a process method, and it takes two arguments, a basically a request, and we should be familiar with what a request is, some message that we are request uh, from, from the client, and another thing, which we'll get back to it later. What we do is do re we do return a response, our response can be seen at this point if we're acquainted with MVC, something like a view, I would say. This is not correct, but just to get the idea, this is what we actually uh, return. Well, but we see here we have, uh, as Steve said, a request and a response. So let's go see what these things really are. Well, they are uh, objects coming from the PSR7 interfaces. So PSR7 is a standard proposed by the Framework Interoperability Group, which was uh, accepted, I guess, something like two years ago. So it has a bit of life now. And it's just uh, an abstraction over HTTP messages. So it has some interfaces, there are seven of them in total, which uh, describe how we can uh, use HTTP messages uh, in our code. So the most important uh, interfaces that we are going to use today also uh, is the, the hierarchy uh, which describes how the HTTP messages are. So we have four of them. There's one common uh, message interface which describes the common parts of all HTTP messages. And then we have two interfaces to describe the request messages and one interface to describe the things specific to the response messages. So let's have a quick look at them for the ones who are not accustomed with them. So well, we have the PSO7 message interface uh, where you have some methods mainly for interacting with the headers 
and with the body of the messages. When we talk about requests, uh, where requests have some specific things, for example, they have a method and they have a new URI, so we have methods for interacting with them. And it was decided uh, for requests that when we are work, uh, working uh, server side, because we can, if we want, we can use also PSP as a HTTP client, but when we're working uh, with PHP as a PHP, uh, HTTP server, uh, well, uh, a request usually has uh, many other information, which, well, by default, PHP stores this information in the super global variables, uh, underscore $get, underscore $post, underscore $session, and so on. Uh, well, to abstract these things away, uh, we have this uh, server request interface where we can access uh, this information. For example, we uh, can access the query parameters, the cookies, uh, uploaded files, uh, and uh, attributes. Uh, well, these attributes, we will see something more about them later. But if you know HTTP Foundation of Symfony, uh, the concept should be familiar for you. And on the other side, uh, when we want to return a response, or if we have an HTTP response, uh, well, uh, it has some specific concept, which is the response status and the reason phrase. For example, 404 not found, something like that. Uh, one important thing when working uh, with uh, PSR7 messages is that they're not structured as we maybe are accustomed to. Uh, because uh, there are no setter methods. So if we want to set uh, the status of a response object, well, we cannot uh, call, use the first line and say, say set status code uh, 418, I'm a teapot. Uh, well, what we, you need to do is just really to create a new object, so to create a new response. And to do that, you say, okay, you take the response object you already have, and you create a new object where you say, okay, I want this new object to be completely identical to the previous one, and the only thing I will modify is the status code. So I will get a new object, and then I can decide what to do with that new object. If I want, I can just put it in the same variable, so I will lose the value of the previous one, but if I want, I cannot do that and keep the two responses in my code together and just work with them. Uh, why uh, this works like this? Well, because it was thought that uh, using the so-called value object would be a nice idea because HTTP messages, well, if you have two HTTP messages which differs from just the status code, well, they're just two different HTTP messages. They're not the same HTTP uh, message uh, modified slightly, but they are two different objects. So to emphasize this, uh, it was chosen to use a value object. What's a value object? A value object is just an object whose identity is given by the sum of all its attributes. So, for example, a good example to understand what is a value object is if you think about money. For example, if you have two, two coins of 10 kunas, if you have two different coins, well, you don't care which one do you have you can give one or the other and you pay the exact same price. Uh, so the same uh, is for value object. Uh, when you have all its attributes, uh, that completely determines which object you are working with. At the same time, you cannot say 10 kunas, set value 100 kunas. It would be uh, too easy. I mean, <laughs> that'd be nice, but it <laughs> doesn't work that way. Yeah. So you need to get another, uh, another um, piece of paper with the number 100 on that, and that's exactly the exact same thing as another 100 um, kunas bill. They're going to be the same thing, but you cannot like, change its value to a different value, so that's what. Uh, and since you cannot change any value on a value object, you can just use it to create a new value. You cannot change anything, so a value object is forever. Once you have it, it's immutable completely. Okay, so yeah, let's go and Let's go towards the first exercise. What we do is we do checkout branch number three, welcome. So far what we had was like the 
vanilla plain installation of Zend Expressive, whereas, whereas now we do start with the code of our uh, demo application, workshop application. So we get into branch 03, and if we do a pause to the home route we've seen before, uh, with a get request to um, PHP middle or WebC, we should see this welcome to Web Samarcam uh, output. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Get checkout 03. 03 is the name of the branch. But we'll get back to that. I will, I will have, uh, when, when exercise come, we will have, have the whole thing there. So uh, no need to catch up right now. So what we would like to get, and this is the first thing to do, is creating a new route, a hello route, which returns us this, uh, this outcome. We would like a, re a response saying hello random PHP -er, if no arguments are passed. And we would like to say hello and the name passed as a parameter, as a name parameter, to be displayed there. And that's a, the reason why Marco told us about the response interface, because we, uh, we, the request and response interfaces, because we will need to use them. So, first exercise for the day, which we'll, we will have 10 minutes to do that, is getting to branch 03 and creating a hello route and displaying the output hello name, where name is either the value of the name parameter or a uh, value we can choose. Remember, we have the docs readme file providing some tips and some sort of step-to-step -step instruction if you get lost through branches or exercises. I suggest checking it out. Uh, for the moment, we'll be around, so if anyone has any question or if feel she's stuck, let's just raise your hand and we'll be there. Okay. Enjoy your work. Most of uh, have you have finished it? Uh, not, not a problem. We can continue. So this is about the solution for the exercise. We do have created a new hello route, uh, taking us into the app action, hello action. And the action itself looks uh, like something like this. Um, I received some questions about the, how, on how to get the uh, name parameter. And this is the um, method to use, which will get back to us the list of all parameters. And it's not uh, possible here to get a single parameter. So we need, because of the PSR7 interface, to, to get all of the uh, parameters and then take the parameter that we need. There are some similar things, and I get confused all the time about that. But yeah. this is if we want to get query parameters, how to go. So. Next step. Next well, exercise. If you want to check out our solution, you can go to the next branch, 04-hello-name. But it should be as yours, uh, more or less. Uh, so now let's move on. We can, if you want to go on, we could go directly to the branch 06-chocolates-route. And well, we skipped the branch five because in the branch five, what we did was to put inside the repository all the domain. So now I would like to spend, yeah, one minute to talk to you about the sweetness of our domain. So our domain is just about chocolates. Uh, as Steve said, I'm a big fan of chocolate. Uh, and in particular, I do not enjoy only eating chocolate, particularly dark chocolate but I enjoy collecting chocolate wrappers. So when I eat the chocolate, I do not throw away the wrapper. I just put them uh, in a special place in my house, and now I have a kind of collection like this. It's more or less 850 wrappers. Uh, there are not so many. There are people who have much, much more. And OK, let's just tell you what our application uh, will do. So our application is just um, a repository for chocolate wrappers. So uh, users of our application will be able to retrieve data about the chocolates which are present in our application. So we'll have, for example, a route 
uh, slash chocolates, where we can see a list of all the chocolates that are present. And then we will have also a way to add a new chocolate to our collection. Uh, it will be the submit route, because uh, any user will be able to submit a new chocolate. Then the idea is that only uh, admin users will be able to approve or to delete a chocolate in the collection. Well, that's all the domain, that's all there is to it. It's pretty simple. We didn't want to make it too big. Uh, it's what uh, works well, I guess, for our workshops today. So, for example, if you go again in Postman and go to the slash chocolates uh, path, you should see something like this. It's a list of chocolates. Well, there are some good ones and some less good ones. And, well, uh, we would like to do a little detour to see how we manage to obtain such a page. So, uh, as we did in the exercise, the first thing to do is to go in the config routes file and add a new route. In this case, it's less chocolates, uh, and it will be handled by the chocolates action class. Uh, so, next up, we go to the chocolates action class, and the body of the process method, that is the method which is called by the framework to handle the request, is just nothing else that return new JSON response, uh, and we pass to the JSON response some data, which is the collection of chocolate, and we will retrieve this data from a service, that is the chocolate service interface, and from the service we just retrieve all the chocolates that we have. So the only thing that changed here with respect to the welcome page or the hello page you did is that we have a service passed uh, with dependency injection. Uh, nothing else changed. So mm, where uh, and how the framework is able to pass this service in our action? How can we do that. Uh, so we need to configure our dependency injection container to know where it can retrieve that service. So if you remember uh, when Steve at the beginning told us these are the main files the framework looks, uh, well there was this config config PHP file where all the configuration is and well we had these three entries the app config provider class and some other configuration files. Uh, well, the configuration uh, strictly related with our application usually goes in the app config provider class, which is inside our application. And if we go to that class, you can navigate with PHP Storm to go there. Uh, well, there's a section. Uh, well, that class just as a method which returns an array of configuration. One part of it is the dependencies. And we say, okay, uh, we tell our dependency injection container there are some factories that we will use to build our object. So for example, uh, when we need an instance of the chocolate action class, uh, we will tell the dependency injection container, well, you can use the chocolate action factory to build it. Okay, then we said, okay, but the chocolate action class has a chocolate service interface dependency. So our dependency injection container, while it builds the chocolate action class, first it will need to build a chocolate service interface, an instance of this uh, interface. Well, we'll still do that using our dependency injection container, configuring it and telling it, well, just use the chocolate service factory. And then the chocolate service factory will need to interact with the repository which knows where the database is. So uh, that will be a chocolates class and we'll tell our dependency injection container, well, use the SQL chocolates factory class and so on. That class will need to have a dependency, there's the actual doctrine connection to the database. At a certain point, we'll end this game 
and the dependency injection container is able to return as uh, the chocolate injection class. But let's have a quick look how this chocolate section factory class uh, is. Well, uh, it's nothing else that well, it doesn't need to be a class, first thing. Uh, we chose uh, to use a class. Uh, it needs to be uh, any callable, can do. So we use a factory with underscore underscore invoke class, and it's not any callable. The first argument needs to be a container interface instance. And that container interface instance will just be used to retrieve the dependency of our chocolate action class. So this class just knows, uh, using the container, how to build an instance of the chocolate action class. Well, uh, we mentioned this container interface. Just uh, two words. What's this? Well, it's uh, an instance of PSR11. Uh, Anybody not familiar with PSR11, what it is, where it came from? OK, somebody. Uh, well, this is just another uh, PHP standard proposed by the Framework Interoperability Group, uh, which just defines how we retrieve things from a dependency injection container. So it's a really simple interface. It has just two methods. Well, let's start from the easiest one. There's a method has, which takes a string, call ID here, and returns a boolean. Uh, we can use this method to know if our dependency injection container knows about something. So uh, do you know about chocolate section? Well, yes, I do know about chocolate section. So if you want to put it in very simple terms, in our factories, we will have the containers per meter. So when we need a dependency, we'll just invoke container get, and we'll get whatever we need. Yeah, and That's the get method very simple. Uh, it takes always a string. Uh, if it's able to build what we need, it will return what we need. Uh, if it's not able to, it will just throw an exception. Pretty easy interface. <laughs> if, we're there, if we're there, we, we, we oh, screwed okay. up something. <laughs> okay, I just thought we screwed up something with the presentation. Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I hope not. Uh, right, so let's get back on track. We were at the chocolate route in uh, Postman with the list of all the chocolates. Well, what we'd like you to do now is uh, to do another exercise. Uh, we've got two options here. Uh, the first option is just create a new route. We take slash chocolate slash an ID of a chocolate. And if that's the value ID, we are using UUIDs. So universal identifiers, not just uh, standard integers. Uh, well, if that is a value, uh, a real ID of the chocolate, just return all the data of the chocolate. To do this, you just will need to interact with the domain. You have a method that will return all the data to you. And the other, well, that's the alternative B, chocolate details. You can. Uh, there's something wrong here. Uh, um, OK, alternative A should not be user list, but it's chocolate details. And so you need to create a chocolate details route, chocolate slash ID, where ID is a proper ID of the chocolate wrapper in our domain. And you need to interact with the domain with that class. The domain is the same that is used in the chocolate route. I told you we had screwed up something. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, another option you could do, or if you uh, have time, you could just do both, is just replicate what we did for chocolates and do that for users. So just create a, a page which responds to the slash user uh, path, uh, which will return a list of all the users. Uh, the first one has some more concept that comes uh, to be used. You need to put a parameter in the route, so you need to know how to do that, you need to, how to retrieve the value of the parameter in your action. So uh, the first one is a, a little bit more advanced, the second one should be exactly the same as the chocolate section. And yeah, if uh, there's a docs readme HTML file which can provide some uh, hints again, some hints, so if you yeah. feel lost there are 
uh, methods, suggestions on what to use, on where to look up for documentation, which is hopefully going to speed up things. And all right, so at 11, there should be a coffee break. So now it's 10.35. So up until the coffee break, you have time to do this exercise or exercises. And when you're done, we can go to the coffee break and come back here at 11.50. And again, first one finishing the exercise, uh, one of the two, please raise your hand and so that we know I get feedback about timing. Okay, so, but well, before we continue, we're talking about chocolate and we've got yeah, yeah. people who finished first. We got two pieces of uh, Italian Modica chocolate. It's a weird thing to try it out. So for those who finished first, first and second exercise, try it out. Don't throw away the wrappers or he'll get mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not that big. But. <laughs> Uh, all right, so just have a glimpse of the solution of the chocolate ID part uh, alternative. So as many of you did, well, the, the main thing was to use the get attribute method of the request to retrieve the, the ID value that was passed in the route. The, well, that was the, 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 the point. Well, this attribute is just uh, a mechanism that exists in the server request interface uh, that's used to pass information between one middleware and the other. So what happens here is that in the when we do the routing, and there are some middleware doing the routing, uh, that ID is stored in the ID attribute. And so, so that later, in our application, uh, in our, let's say, controller, uh, we can retrieve it and use it to do stuff as we did here. Okay, if you want, you can uh, check out the 07 brands to check the solution of the alternative A, or you can check out the 08-users uh, brand to check out the solution uh, for a second branch. And okay, uh, since now something else starts. I would like to stop here for the moment and we can enjoy the coffee break for 15 minutes and then we come back fresh and we start again to fight against this middleware. Yep. See you in 15. So now there's an interesting turning point in my opinion because we've been doing something so far and we missed something along the way I think. If we notice, we actually implemented some actions and they were implementing the middleware interface. So without knowing or maybe knowing it, we've been using middleware so far. So I think it's about time we just realize what we've been doing and to see how middleware works and to see how we can exploit middleware because so far it would seem to us that middleware would just be another way to describe um, action controller of a framework, for instance. But we now see that middleware is something a bit different. OK, so let's see and the signature. What we have here is a process method. And the process method, what it does, it takes, it takes two parameters. It takes a request parameter where we have seen we have an object, a PSR7 compliant object describing the request we receive. And we have another thing, which will turn up to shortly. What we do return is a response interface, which we've also seen is part of PSR7 uh, interface. But what is this middleware thing? Think is that middleware is a thing, as it is described somewhere, taking a request as its input and returning a response as an output. So I think we can end our workshop here, I think. That's defined and that's it. But the first time I saw this, it wasn't really clear to me what this was. So let's try to dig a bit deeper into, the, into this. And 
A uh, typical metaphor for middleware is that of an onion. And why? Because that onion has a few layers. So if we think about middleware as an onion layer, we see that on the inner level, we got our domain logic. So our uh, core domain things, the actions we want to perform on the domain, something detached from the framework and everything else we use to interact with the user. Whereas all of these layers are all of these layers, external layers, stacked one into the other, are layers of so-called middleware. Like each one of these layers can be some middleware. That's just to familiarize ourselves with the concepts and see where we are, how it is modeled within what we are doing. So we can have different layers, and a request, what a request does is transversing all of the layers until it reaches at some point some action, which is like the inner layer of our, of our thing, the, uh, interacting with the domain and returning a response. Again, traversing all of the layers back. In the uh, reverse order. Sorry? In the reverse order. Yeah, in the reverse order. Exactly. That's uh, a good thing. We remember we had the second parameter of our middleware which was the delegate, because we had the first parameter we remember was the request, the second was the delegate. So what is a delegate? A delegate is everything just uh, within a layer of middleware, everything which stays inside of that area. So next time we see a middleware uh, signature, uh, we know that the two parameters we get are the request and the delegate, and what we will return is the response. But now, let's try to understand why this whole thing makes sense and why it is can be useful in many situations. Let's do this through another metaphor, a completely different metaphor and an example. Let's, when we do uh, want to board for a flight to go somewhere else, we need to pass tr uh, through a certain s number of steps. We need to drop our baggage, we need to have our passport checked, we need to board the plane somehow, either through a tunnel, a bus, or something. So there are certain steps which need to be performed independently from the flight which we're going to take. Like, no matter if we want to fly to New York City, if we want to fly to uh, Honolulu, if we want to fly to Sydney, we do need to, from the uh, airport where we live from, we need to perform all of these steps. And the same thing, if we think about it, happens even when we jump off of the plane. We need to traverse back all of the steps. Now, why does this thing, this thing does make sense? The thing is that it's not that in metaphorical terms, for every flight we want to take, we will have a new uh, baggage dropping um, stand to be created every time, a new passport checking facility with a new policeman instantiated and a new bus for taking us from the airport to the airplane to be uh, built. And that is something which might happen within web applications instead. Because if we do not reuse certain services, if we do not like reuse the baggage, baggage drop and claim uh, infrastructure, we do not reuse the passport check infrastructure, we do not reuse the transportation infrastructure, we end up building the same things again and again. So the thing is, can we have something or set up something which we can use across applications? Something dealing with those which we might call cross-cutting concerns. They are not, I mean, strictly inherently uh, related to our domains. They are completely different things, but we'll need to have them almost in every application domain. So can we do something to address this? And the answer is actually middleware, because if we see, this might be seen as the layers of our onions, and this is our domain. So let's see how we can exploit this. And that's where we're going with the next exercise, the next things we're going to see right now. Okay, uh, so let's go on, let's go back to code. And so let's just check out the branch 10-assets.log. And so let's see together before 
you write one, let's see together an example of a middleware. How can we put it inside our application? So uh, the point where we want to act, uh, well, up to now, when we wanted to put a new middleware, we just created a new route, we created a new action, that's what we did up to now. But now, if we want to use something for every action, uh, we did not. We did not need to go into the routes PHP file. We need to go into the config pipeline PHP file. Uh, well, it was mentioned briefly at the beginning. This file. Uh, this is where uh, the the steps that our application goes through are listed. So, in a middleware fashion way, uh, the most external middleware that we have, the first thing that our application does. <coughs> is error handling. So that's what we want to do. We have a try at the beginning of our application. After we do everything else, there's a catch, and we catch some errors, and we do error handling. Then, uh, when you mm, install the skeleton application, you have a routing middleware that just says which route needs to be, which class needs to be invoked to respond to certain requests. Then a dispatch middleware that just calls the the, uh, the 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 action that needs to be used, and at the end uh, there's uh, something another middleware called not found handler that just catches if the request was not uh, handled by any of the previous layers. If any of the previous layer did not return a response, well, there we will return a 404 response. So what are we going to do now? Well, we are adding some other middleware. We, what we want to do is to create uh, an access log. Well, we can have Apache do that for us. But if we want to insert in our access log some details, for example, which user did request that page, we need to interact with our domain. Apache cannot just give us that information. So if we want to have such an information, we can, uh, we can add a new middleware that stands around the routing. So for every route, we will perform this operation. And well, uh, just uh, an implementation detail, this SSLog middleware that we are using requires another middleware to be executed externally of it just to determine precisely the client IP of the user. So uh, as we saw uh, in our exercises, uh, whenever we want to create a class in a, a non-trivial way, so if we, were, if we have some, a class has some dependency, uh, we need to inform our dependency injection container how to build it with a factory. So what we do is we do define, do give this information to our dependency injection container in the config autoload dependencies.global.php file. Why do we are not using the config provider we used before? Uh, well, the config provider sits inside our SRC app folder, so it's something that is strictly connected with our application. While this file dependencies.global it's just a file that sits somewhere outside our application. It's just uh, some global configuration that we can take and reuse for any project. And here we just say, OK, uh, dependency checking container, we have a new dependency. And we'll, you will use this factory to build your access log class. You will use that access log factory class. And in that access log factory class, we are just uh, doing some configuration of our access log. We are building our access log. We're passing to it a monolog instance to do some actual logging, configure with some uh, uh, file system path where to write uh, the informations. And then we say, OK, we want you to write uh, the information with this format. And that's just some kind of format. You can check by yourself the details. And all right, so for example, if you are in the git checkout uh, 10 ss log branch, uh, you can try to go to Postman 
do some get requests, and then go into the data, uh, I guess is, let me check. Uh, 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 data log folder, you will find uh, an access.log.txt uh, file, and if you do new requests, you will see that it will add their information about your request. Uh, in particular, there's well the path, the time uh, that the request took to be executed, and some other information. All right, so at this point, uh, I would like to ask you, is this middleware concept quite clear to you? Are you already really familiar with it? Would you like to experiment to use it? Yeah? Okay, so I guess. Uh, yeah, before we do that, actually, I would like to go a step backward. I didn't see people very, um, very uh, active on getting back to um, having understood what middleware is. And this, um, here, what we mentioned uh, um, is this config pipeline file. We remember we have two. Uh, places where we basically define what middleware is going to uh, be working on our application. So the first one is config pipeline and here we stack, we add layers to the onions. So if we go back to this, we in the config pipeline uh, file, we do add these layers. So here we say, hey, add another layer of middleware. Whereas at the route, the config route uh, .php file, what we do is, once we are arrived at the layer where uh, routing needs to be performed and which action needs to be performed, we choose which uh, piece of middleware to have in that onion representing our request response cycle. So pipeline builds up the whole onion, whereas the uh, routes parameter specifies uh, which specific inner layer that specific onion has. And another thing about factories, especially for those who are familiar with Symfony, uh, here pretty much the uh, object construction is performed through code rather than configuration. So what we do, we need to uh, be aware that the first parameter we have in our uh, factories is the container itself. So it's up to us here to use it. And we take the container, we act through a uh, uh, PSR 11 compliant get uh, request, which builds uh, the object we're interested in fetching and uh, allows us to use it. So in this case, we wanted to have the configuration, for example, parameter we get from the uh, dependence injection container, and then we do all of the rest. So first exercise, let's put our hands on middleware for the very first uh, real time, doing something not trivial as implementing an action. What we need to do is we start from uh, branch 10 access log and we want to create a simple caching middleware. So we want to uh, cache and store through a file, for instance. I don't know if someone wants to install Redis and save that to a, a RAM cache, up to you, I mean, but that's not the point of today's exercise. So we start simple and just creating a uh, cache file for all of the get requests we get. That means uh, interacting with the domain. What we want to do is the first request we get interacts with the delegate, with what comes next, fetches the relevant information and stores them. The next time we get a request for the same URL, we want to return the cached results, not to interact with the whole uh, delegate again. So. That's what we uh, need to do. And as a bonus, if we want to uh, do something more, we can add two configuration parameters so that we also get used to, um, uh, to um, interact with the configuration. And add, for instance, the path where we want to the cache file to be saved and the time interval after which the cache uh, will expire. So that's a bonus, but the important thing is to, to create the cache in the first instance. So that's what up next for the next 25 minutes. Are there any questions, doubts? Let's go then. 
Okay, so let's check out the um, solution to this exercise. To do that, we get to uh, branch 11, response cache. And here, the relevant part, uh, it's not here. The slide, it's missing, okay. Slide is missing, uh, maybe because it was, was too long, but I'll try to remember it by memory. So what, what we've done is to uh, act on the uh, config slash pipeline file, and we added a certain point, just as we did with the sslog middleware, where we'll add our caching uh, la middleware layer. And then what we will need to do is to configure among the dependencies, so config uh, dependencies global.php file and tell the framework, tell our application that we're going to use a response cache uh, uh, middleware. And then uh, here we need to declare what the um, response cache factory will be, building up our response cache middleware. That's the same identical thing to access log middleware, same thing, just doing a different, uh, obtaining a different result, and that is why it's not in the code here. I mean, we've seen it before, it's exact same thing. So we proceed, but before doing that, just a note. I mean, are we the first uh, human beings on Earth needing a uh, response cache? What do you think? Are we? I see someone nodding. <laughs> it's not encouraging. Probably not. I mean, we're, we're not the first one who ever needed a cache. So, like reinventing the wheel is not something we want to do. And that's where middleware actually comes into play and how useful it can be. Why is that? The thing is that middleware, as we've seen, aims at interoperability. So, Marco. <laughs> yeah, so, well, if you go online and go around and check it, there's a lot of middleware already present that you can just take and reuse in your own project. Uh, well, here we just uh, wrote some examples of middleware you can find online. But uh, to save you the, the hustle of finding all the middlewares that are out there, uh, we put up a little application, you can check out, it's called PHP Middleware. Uh, it's just a simple repository where you can go and search for existing middlewares. So the, the backend of the application is also open source, so if you want to provide your own middleware, you can just or tweet it to us or uh, do a pull request of, it's just a JSON file with a list of uh, middleware with some data and we try to maintain it quite uh, up to date with the middleware that comes out. Uh, during time up to now, I think we have some 100, 150 middlewares uh, listed here. So uh, with this, we have a lot of middlewares caching access logs and things, uh, authentication, authorization, and well, whatever. And so writing middleware application becomes pretty easy because we just go on the web, we find the middlewares that we need, and we put them on the pipeline. And that's all we have to do. Uh, well, obviously, there's the domain part that nobody's going to write that for us. So that we still have to do. So we've seen that uh, we've played right now. So far, we've been uh, just like reading a blog article where things are always easy and everything seems so obvious. But the thing is that uh, we would like to interact with a real world application. We've seen routes like for uh, implying no modifications in our domain, which very rarely happens. We actually do have other actions. So let's check out branch 15, delete chocolate. And what we will have here is we will have a few more routes. And as we see, they do involve actions uh, which are going to change the state of our application. It's going to uh, change something within our database. So we'll be able to submit some chocolate wrapper, say, hey, there's this new wrapper. We'll be able to approve, say, okay, we, it's not just some spam. And we want to delete 
uh, some chocolate wrapper if it was Pam instead. So we have these actions. They are, okay, so th there are these routes and there are the uh, related actions. They do work as we've seen so far from a middleware point of view. So that's not really interesting again, but there's a thing. If someone modifies our, our database, most likely we would like to have some sort of authentication in place. We don't want just anyone to come and delete all of our wrappers without any sort of checking in that. Will so I my whole collection? <laughs> uh, exactly, Marco would no, get no, 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 no. mad or, or worse than that. So what we need to, to do now is to enforce some sort of authentication. And what we're going to do is to do that through uh, middleware. So, thing is, we've seen how to stack middleware in the uh, pipeline and now to uh, add within the routes. But what we can do is we can stack middleware on the routes as well. So we can say, before the uh, submit or approve chocolate action is invoked, we want this specific piece of middleware to be uh, enabled, to be called. And we do that. We call HTTP authentication class in both these uh, situations. And this is what the factory looks like. It's like as we've seen before, we declare the middleware we want to use here, and we declare in the, let's remember, in the config autoload dependencies uh, configuration file. Because these here, this, was, this has proven to be tricky for someone during the exercises. This is, let's just keep in mind, this could be seen just as a string. It's just a name. There we're not dealing with any object yet. There we're saying we want this, I don't know, John Doe object. And how is that John Doe object created? We define that within config autoload dependencies. And there we say, okay, for John Doe object, we want to invoke the John Doe factory. And that's where we're going to, where we're going to create our John Doe object. So here we have the basic, uh, basic HTTP authentication factory, which could have been the John Doe factory as well. What we do here is we have the first parameter. We remember the container where we can get all the dependencies from. And so we do take off the user service interface, the, oh, actually the user service <laughs> implementation Yep. returning to us all of the users. And here, okay, this is not like, most likely not the smartest implementation, because what we do is we do get all the username password combinations from the user file and we store therein. So if we do have a lot of users, that's going to explode, but that's not the point. This is just a toy example for the sake of this workshops. The thing is that here we make our middleware independent from all of the domain because we say, hey, pass all of the data and we have this uh, array here, the credentials array containing all the user and password um, records so that we know if a user is valid within this domain or not. And what we do at the end is then we return this new uh, basic authentic HTTP authentication. We set all of the credentials, and here we say when, um, when a uh, username and password parameters will be passed, how to uh, fetch them. Or Mark, do you have, if you have <laughs> any better way to explain this. No, well, just one thing to add. Now, if you want to go to Postman and try to do some uh, post requests on the approve or on the delete action, uh, without authentication, you will receive uh, an authenticated response. And uh, you will have to add the user details, uh, username and password. Uh, the password are stored in clear, so do not do that at home, please. Uh, that's just for the sake of the workshop. Uh, you can find them on the database. Well, we have two users. One, the username is user, and the other username is admin, and the password are both password. So pretty straightforward. This can be safely done in production. Yeah, yeah, we did it. No, no. <laughs> no, no. Did you do that? that? No. Uh, 
Okay, but anyway, talking about security, usually basic HTTP authentication is not the most secure way to authenticating users. Uh, there are better ways to do that, and uh, we would like to challenge you uh, with uh, uh, changing basic HTTP authentication to JVT authentication. So, uh, anybody not familiar with uh, JVT authentication? Okay, there are some. Well, let me do, do the opposite. Who's familiar and has used uses uh, JVT? Looks like there are like 70% of people <laughs> who are not here with us anymore. <laughs> okay. No, maybe just too shy. That's yeah. okay. So, uh, if you want to try, uh, if it works with the JVT authentication, uh, you can check out that branch, but that's, uh, say, we will want to work our way up to there. And one interesting, interesting thing is that if we go to the config routes PHP file where we added our HTTP authentication before, in this new branch, well, nothing changed. That's a nice thing. We swapped our authentication mechanism without changing anything in our middleware pipeline. Not in the pipeline, not in the routes. It's just only a separate thing where we uh, end up modifying things. So just uh, quick words on how JVT authentication works. So we got a user who wants to access some content in our application server. Well, bec before doing that, uh, it will need to post a request to some authentication server. In our case, it will be our same application, as we will see. And uh, just signing in in this authentication server uh, with uh, a username and password. You can use Facebook login, Google login, or whatever. And uh, what you will get back from the authentication server is just a JVT token. So a little string uh, encrypted in a safe way with some information about the users inside of it. And then uh, it will be responsibility of the user himself uh, or the client, uh, generally speaking, uh, to send that token uh, to the application server. And then the application server will use that token, will decrypt the token, will verify it and safe, uh, decrypt the token, retrieve the user information from it, and then use uh, uh, the user information to do authentication, eventually authorization also, and just return the content requested by the users. So that's the basic workflow uh, for JVT authentication. So uh, in our case, uh, in the branch 17.1, you will find already a token route that you can call on Postman. It's a post uh, route. Uh, if you do that call, uh, authenticated the user, oh well, like this, you need to pass a username parameter, just use admin, and a password parameter, that's just password. Uh, you will get a response like this with a token and a timestamp which says when the token is going to expire. Okay, so uh, now the, left, uh, the rest is left to you. So uh, we would like to you to complete JVT authentication. We already have a way to get the token. Now, uh, when you perform the other request that needs HTTP authentication, so it's the approve and the delete route, we would like you to uh, swap basic HTTP authentication with JVT authentication. An alternative to this exercise is uh, start from branch 16.1, where basic authentication is in place, and do some authorization. Because, for example, for the approve and the delete route, we want just admin user to be able to perform those actions. And so we will need some middleware after uh, authentication to just check on the user's data and see if that user is allowed to perform that action. So uh, it's 12, 25, uh, 12, 45 in 20 minutes, we should uh, close the workshop. So 
we will need some time for final remarks. So I say 30 minutes is a bit too much. Just we'll leave you 15 minutes just to try to start one of these two alternatives. And then we will come back together for the final remarks. OK. Nobody's alive. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> Who's alive? That's okay, we got four people alive in this room, and that's a relief. And, and that's <laughs> I was problem. worried that no one would have gotten alive. <laughs> All right, uh, so with not so much time, and we'd like some final notes, so let's just go back with the slides. Can you hear Marco? Uh, is, is the mic on? I can hear. Yeah, I guess it is. Oh, okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> All right. So if you want, you can check out the, both the solution uh, for the part about using JVT authentication. You have 17.3 uh, for the part about uh, uh, authorization. Uh, you have uh, the 18 branch. Uh, let's just look quickly uh, the solution for the JVT exercise. Uh, so the, the main point was to find where to say to the application that we are, were not using basic HTTP authentication, but instead we were using JVT authentication. And that point where that information was is uh, was in the dependencies.global.php file. And so we replaced, uh, you replaced the basic HTTP authentication factory with something like a JVT authentication factory. And the routes PHP, as I said before, uh, remain like that. If you did also the authorization uh, exercise, uh, the main thing was to add this authorization middleware after authentication and before the actual action uh, in the routes, in the appropriate routes. And well, Quick solution for the authorization middleware. Well, nothing so complicated. We take uh, the attribute JVT authentication dot colon colon class, and we take data that's contained in the JVT token, and from that the username. Then we use the username to interact with our service to retrieve the user object. We ask to the object if that user is an actually an administrator. If it's not, we return a 403 not authorized response. Otherwise, we delegate the process to the, uh, to the, to the delegate what's inside. OK, you will find uh, on the repository also something about testing, uh, how to test middlewares. You can have a look at it uh, at home, because unfortunately, we don't have uh, time for that now. Uh, so there's some exercises to test middlewares both with PHP unit or BHAT. And well, then you have the solutions. And yeah, so now that the end's approaching, what do we come home with? Just to make a recap. Not a nice cow, but so where were we lying when we were uh, telling at the beginning that we, we would not have been focused on uh, Xander Expressive? Sort of. I mean, we've been using it so far, and the concepts were somewhat related to it. But that's not the whole point, because our point wanted to be around middleware. Or onions. And, or onions, actually, yeah. And why am I telling this? Because, OK, we've used a single framework. But let's see something about middleware and other tools that we can use. Yeah, in fact, uh, middleware is something that uses just PSR7 interface. There's a PSR15 interface that's been proposed, not yet accepted, which is exactly uh, on uh, middleware. So middleware, it's not a concept which uh, is specific uh, to Zend Expressive, but you can use the same concept in other frameworks. For example, you may have heard about the Slim framework. It's another micro framework. And well, you can use the same mm, middleware we were using today 
for Zen Expressive. You can just take those and use as they are, use them in Slim. Or, and that's how you ask them, we have a pipe method in Zen Expressive. In Slim, you have an add method. But the, the idea is exactly the same. And you have a lot of other middleware dispatchers, uh, so applications and components that work on middlewares. Some are Telegraph, Middleman, Ellipse PHP dispatcher, and there are many of them. You can uh, search them on the web. And well, each one of them has a particular specific way uh, to be configured, so a way where you can tell how the pipeline is defined, which middleware comes outer or, and which one comes inner. But the important thing is that at the end, uh, the architecture you're working with is the same for every one of these frameworks or these components. So for example, today we had a look at this column. We used Zen Expressive, which had Strategility as a middleware dispatcher. We had some middleware that we wrote and we used, and below everything we had PSR7 implementation, which was the Actoros. Uh, if you take Slim Framework, uh, well, Slim Framework is some kind of a micro but full-fledged framework, so it has its own implementation of PSR7, its own uh, middleware dispatcher component, and its own framework things, form rendering and dependency injection container, and whatever. Uh, and then you can take other components and use whatever you want. The important thing that you will need to take home today is that uh, there. Sure. Uh, the middleware layer is common and reusable between all of them. So writing middleware components, we're just not writing them for our own application. Uh, but we are writing them in an interoperable way so that we can take them, reuse them, give it to some other people that can reuse them. We can just go online, download something, write a factory, put them in configuration somehow, and we have uh, assets log, authorization, authentication, um, whatever you like, middleware already ready to be used in our applications. And I, I think it, it's important to notice, in my opinion, that dealing with such cross-cutting concerns has been done so far in different ways, some of which were like polluting our domain logic because we were putting these uh, uh, not related actions all around of our business logic, or we used other approaches. We used to we used uh, observer patterns. We used uh, event-based approaches. And the thing is that they all, in a way or another, suffered from some, um, some pitfalls, some problems, especially in the event-based approach, which is nice. I kind of like it. But it makes it hard to follow things. You uh, trigger an event, and if your colleague doesn't know about that, he doesn't know what to catch, what to listen on. And that's, in my opinion, uh, it can be problematic in complex applications where different people work. Whereas if we do use the, like the onion approach, the good thing is that, after all, despite we're uh, detaching things, so we do not have very tight coupling, which is bad and we know about that, we still are able to control our flow. So using the interfaces, we're able to uh, not tie things together, but still know what's going on. And I think that's uh, a value which can be provided to us by middleware. So to end up things, what Marco was telling us is right and correct. We, although today we've been working on this vertical uh, line here, uh, the message won't be a different one. We use this just because, but we want to focus on this layer here. This means that we can write middleware for expressive one day and use it with another framework another day. But even above that, it's the idea of middleware, the concept. We can use a different implementation, for instance, and just know what this thing is. This thing is. We know that we can handle cross-cutting concern without polluting the domain, having the events, and all of the stuff. It's, I think it's a different way uh, of thinking, 
uh, it's a different approach. And in my opinion, it makes sense to at least know a bit about it. So the thing is that, yes, we told you at the beginning, our aim was about interoperability, not working uh, with Zen Expressive strictly. We hope we've managed to convey that. And well, we thank you very much for attention and attending. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.